Now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Haidt. Dr. Haidt is a Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at New York University Stern School of Business. He was a professor at the University of Virginia from 1995 until 2011. He received his BA from Yale University and his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the author of several books, including two New York Times bestsellers, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, and The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, and he's co-author of that book. In 2019, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was chosen by Prospect Magazine as one of the world's top 50 thinkers. Dr. Haidt is a social psychologist whose research focuses on morality, its emotional foundations, developmental course, and cultural variations, including the cultures of progressives, conservatives, and libertarians. He's noted, my research in recent years focused on the moral foundations of politics and on ways to transcend the culture wars by using recent discoveries in moral psychology to foster more civil forms of politics. Morality binds people together into teams that seek victory, not truth. Dr. Hyde has helped us understand how morality both unites and divides people. Dr. Hyde, what I've appreciated about your work is how you deepened our understanding of the motivations and forces that impede our ability to hear, understand, and integrate differences. This morning, we will hear more about your passion to address the plight of Gen Z. Dr. Height will describe how social media has affected Gen Z and what groups and communities might do to address this. Welcome to AGPA, Dr. Height, and we are thankful to have this opportunity. Well, good morning, AGPA, and thank you so much, Alexis, for that, for that introduction. Um, I want to start by congratulating you all uh, for your bravery in uh, facing airplanes and subways and whatever else it took you to get here. And I want to congratulate the program committee for picking the last possible week in which you could have had this conference. <laughs> so today, uh, or yesterday, the state of California declared a state of emergency, um, but I took the subway up here from Greenwich Village and not a single person was wearing a mask. And so what I'm getting at is New Yorkers are not panicking. We need about seven to nine more days, and then we will panic. <laughs> so next week, and you're going to see it, because like, I was thinking, should I take a mask? But I thought, well, I'm going to feel really geeky if I wear a mask and nobody else is. So, and sure enough, nobody was wearing a mask. But you know, social processes, as soon as it's going to flip very quickly. And so if this meeting was held in one week, a lot of you wouldn't have come in. You know, so anyway, well done. OK. <laughs> Now, um, I was very pleased to, to get this invitation from Alexis uh, because I'm a social psychologist really interested in groups and group dynamics. Problem is, social psychologists in the last 30 or 40 years don't look at group dynamics very much. Most of what we do is we put an undergraduate at a computer terminal and we give him stimuli to rate. That's not really social. It's social cognition, but it's not really social. And you, in this, in this organization and in this room, you understand groups. You develop an extraordinary expertise in the subtleties of group dynamics and the way they influence each other. The problems we're facing as a society now are especially problems of groups and groups that we don't understand. And so um, when I was preparing, uh, preparing this talk, and I was just looking on the website a bit, and I found there's an, a, a video welcoming people, and a quote from one of the members, I'm devoted to groups and to helping societies heal. And this is the area of expertise that we most need right now. As I'll show you, we're going, 
haywire in a lot of ways because we don't understand group dynamics. So I want to share with you some thoughts that I, might help you to be more effective, and then I want you to be more effective. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about what's going wrong uh, nowadays and, and see how some areas of moral and social psychology might, might help you. Uh, so normally what I do in my talks is I, I go through the three great untruths. Uh, so my book with Greg Lukianoff, The Coddling of the American Mind, is about three terrible, terrible ideas. Ideas so bad that if a young person embraces all three, they probably will be a failure in life. And I apply the ideas to whatever the, the issue is here. But as I was preparing and thinking about what you do, I thought rather than going through the three in order like that, what I'm going to do instead is I picked out um, five, well, four really substantive areas that I want to go into more detail on that might, might help you. And so I'm going to take four main ideas from the coddling of the American mind and try to apply them uh, to what I, I think is your, your interests and, and challenges. Um, so first, uh, raise your hand if, so how many of you actually have members of Gen Z in any of your practices? That means people born in 1996 or later, they're about 23 years old. Raise your hand if you have, oh wow, a lot of you, okay. And uh, if you didn't put your hand up, of course, you will have Gen Z in the next few years. I mean, so uh, this, you have to understand what's happening. It's, it's a gigantic social uh, wave. It's very important for us to understand this. How many of you have children born after 1995? Raise your hand. Okay, you too, you're probably wrestling with some of these issues if your kids are teenagers, and if not, you will be very soon. Um, and how many of you care about democracy in any way, shape, or form? Raise your hand. Okay, all right, so I hope, I hope everybody has a stake in this. I hope everybody has some reason why this talk might, uh, might be relevant to, to what you do. So let's begin with the untuning of democracy. Uh, over, the, over here on this, can you see the screen? Can you? Okay, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll re when there's text, I'll be reading it, but it's mostly images, okay. So um, to understand, so I've felt since about 2015 that things are just getting weird and I couldn't put my finger on it. And the last year I, or two years, I've, I've developed a way of thinking about this that I want to share with you. And so it begins by zooming out. I want you to just zoom out to the universe, like go, go you know, millions of light years away from the earth and, and just contemplate the vast beauty of, of our universe. And, and here's another photograph. And part of the reason I'm doing this is because I study uh, self-transcendent emotions, including the emotion of awe. And one effect that awe has is it opens our minds to new ways of thinking. If you're trying to change someone's psychological constructs, uh, make, you know, not, not just assimilate new ideas to existing, but you want to break up their constructs, awe is very powerful for that. It's been used historically in religious conversions. And so I, I do this with my students. I try to use emotions and awe to help them think in new ways. In this case, I want that effect, but I also want to walk you into a really interesting puzzle about our universe. So this is a way that scientists represent um, the entire history of the universe, all 14 billion years since the Big Bang um, on the left. And at the moment of the Big Bang, uh, matter and energy uh, uh, come in, begin. But there's this weird thing about creation in which there's a few hundred million years where there's no matter, nothing, just energy. And then all of a sudden, matter congeals. We get stars. We get heavier elements. Eventually, we get life. So uh, uh, there's nothing for a long time. And then something happens. Everything congeals. And we're off to the races. Now, um, if you remember your high school physics or college physics class, there's all these physical constants, like the mass of the electron or Avogadro's number, it's all these terms. And uh, in the 20th century, some physicists, such as Stephen Hawking, observed that if you look at all these constants of the universe, these are true everywhere in our universe, some of them, had they been 1% larger or smaller, there would not have been the congealing of matter. And so our universe is very improbable. And this has led some physicists and others to Note, and these are Stephen Hawking's words, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. Now this seems to suggest intelligent design. And many religious people have looked at this and said uh, basically what Thomas Jefferson and other uh, deists said several hundred years ago, that God created the universe 
and then stepped back. And the universe runs by the laws of physics. It's like a giant clock. Um, so that funny finding in physics is at least compatible with such a view. Now, I'm not here to take a bit, I'm not saying that intelligent design happened. I'm only using this as a metaphor. This is my metaphor, that the universe uh, could be thought of almost as if there was intelligent design. But I'm not saying that there was. It's a metaphor. That's the source domain. And a metaphor, you, you understand something in one place. You try to apply that understanding to a target domain. Here's the target domain, liberal democracy. And what I want to suggest is that liberal democracy is extraordinarily improbable. And here I follow um, the biologist E.O. Wilson, uh, who I learned a lot from. Um, he and I, uh, well, many of us, uh, are very interested in human evolution. How did we become the kinds of creatures that we are? Because clearly, if you look at the evolutionary record of our species over millions of years, um, we evolved as tribal primates. We evolved for life in small fission fusion societies, up to about 150 people. Then we tend to split into groups after that. Um, and these groups have intense animistic religion, worshiping rocks and trees and, and, and weather events. Um, and these groups have intense violent intergroup conflict. That's human nature. That's the way things were before civilization in, in most societies in which groups could interact in that way. And if you look at it that way, if you look at human nature and what we evolve for, then, I know these are my words, sort of paraphrasing what Wilson might have said, I would posit to you that we humans are unsuited for life in large, diverse, secular societies. Unless, unless you get certain settings finely adjusted to make possible the development of stable political life. So clearly, we got those. We've done it. We've had stable political life. But the, what I'm trying to say here is that the margin for error might be very small, and we might now be operating outside of that margin of error. Now, um, this is exactly the way the Founding Fathers thought. They were excellent historians with the limited uh, historical literature that they had. And James Madison, in particular, who's the main architect of our, of our constitutional system, um, if you read especially Federalist 10, one of the most brilliant pieces of political writing in human history, read Federalist 10. His top fear was faction, that is splitting, fighting. And he observed, he observed that in all previous democracies, they all burned up, they all blew up, because people reach a point at which they don't care about the common good. They just want to defeat their enemies. This is human nature. Um, and so he was afraid that our democracy, our country, would be like, it would go up in flames. And he has a quote. He says, hence it is that such democracies, now here he's talking about direct democracy, uh, direct democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. So our current concerns, our fears about instability are nothing new. The founders knew human nature, they knew history, they knew that democracy is inherently unstable, prone to break up. And they designed an elaborate system to try to counteract that. In fact, you might think of, you might think of our constitution as being very much an exercise in intelligent design. That's exactly what it was. And they thought of themselves doing it almost in the way that God designed the universe. Can we set it up with checks and balances and, and procedures that will keep it running for a long time? That's exactly the way they thought about it. But how's it going? Well, in the 1990s, a decade that almost everybody in this room remembers, um, uh, most, well, okay, there are a lot of young people here too, but most people in the room remember the 1990s. What a great decade. You know, the it start, opens with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union, and it looked like, it looked like democracy was not just easy, but inevitable. It looked like if we just let North Korea and Iran and Russia and China, let them get wealthy, let them develop a middle class, and guess what? They're going to demand rights. And before you know it, all those countries are going to be liberal democracies. It's the end of history. This is the end of the historical development process, is liberal democracy. That's what we thought in the 90s. Well, history has kind of started back up. 
Now, these, both of these movements, the surprise Brexit vote and then the surprise Trump election, let's be very clear, these were democracy in action. These were not anti-democratic, but boy is it changing, boy are things getting interesting. Um, conflict is arising, especially throughout the West. We're getting the rise of political divisions. Um, uh, we're getting the rise of, of populism, uh, especially right wing, but also left wing. And it's not just in the West. Um, in India, this article is actually from a couple years ago, but Modi has gone even more in that direction. Uh, and Latin America, which has long gone back and forth, is going through uh, an era as well. So, um, uh, and now we're reading books like this, like How Democracies Die how quickly things have changed since the 1990s. It's kind of like, and here's the metaphor, here's the way that helps me understand why things have gotten so weird so fast. It's kind of like somebody reached in to the universe and doubled some of those physical constants. Like suppose God just like doubled the gravitational constant so that gravity was twice as strong everywhere in the universe. Just for fun, he was bored one day, like well let's just see what would happen. And that's kind of the way it feels, and everything is kind of going haywire. Now, who has the power to do that? Who could reach into the fabric of society and, and just change parameters? I submit that there is only one person. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg. Now, I'm, I believe his intentions were good. I believe, I've, I've spoken at Facebook a number of times. It's full of idealistic people. I'm not, this is not a blame game. But there is no doubt that the internet first and then social media later have changed the basic fabric of society in ways that profoundly affect the operation of groups and societies. So um, I have an article that appeared in November in The Atlantic where I go through exactly how social media has made democracy go haywire. I'm not gonna go into that because of time limits, but if you wanna go further into how it happened, uh, just look up the dark psychology of social networks, Google that phrase, and you'll find my article with Tobias Rose Stockwell. Uh, so that's my point about the untuning of democracy. That's the big picture within which we're all operating. We don't understand it. Uh, and eventually, likely, we will reach some sort of accommodation, but it could be a while before politics begins working in a, in a normal or predictable or, or even healthy way. Point number two, let's move on to another way that social media has profoundly changed a whole generation. So that's my, this is the section on what's going on with Gen Z. Now, here are the basic statistics. Here's the I'll give you the basic stats on how Gen Z is so different from the millennials. This is nationally representative American data on what teenagers are doing. And so this graph plots from 1976 on the left edge to 2016 on the right edge, the percentage of 12th graders who have a driver's license. Now, most of us got our driver's license when we were in uh, you know, 10th or 11th grade, when you turned 16. Uh, when I turned 16, I got my driver's license on that day. The only reason you wouldn't get it on your birthday is if your birthday is a Sunday, and then you have to wait till Monday. But we were all incredibly excited to drive. But Gen Z is not excited to drive. Now, sure, they can take Uber, but the point wasn't to get somewhere. The point was to drive a car. I mean, it was really cool. Um, but it was also that you could do things with your friends. And so this shows the plummeting percentage of Gen Z that have ever drunk alcohol. And we're talking about seniors in high school, the percent that have ever tried any alcohol, the percent that have ever had any sort of a romantic date, and the percent that have ever held, had a job. And so what's happening is that college students today, they come into college basically not having had the kinds of experiences that we always expected that an 18 or 19 year old college student have had. They have not separated from their parents and done things independently, especially things with some risk, physical risk or social risk. What are they doing? What are they doing with all the time that they're not doing these other things? You know, they're swiping and liking and looking. They're on their screens most of the time. So, now it's not just one generation, an old fogey like me saying, the kids aren't doing the things that we did. <laughs> It's that the objective indicators of their health are going south. The objective indicators are terrible. So here you see that actually learning disabilities, physical disabilities, ADHD, they're up a little bit, but what's that yellow bar? Psychological disorders. This is the defining difference. So on the left, those first two years, uh, 2010 and 12, everybody on a college campus was a millennial, practically. Um, but as Gen Z begins to arrive around 2014, well, by 2016, they're pretty much all Gen Z. 
And that's when psychological disorders have more than doubled. Gen Z has extraordinarily high rates of psychological disorders. Around 2015, um, schools across the country began saying, we're completely overwhelmed. We can't hire therapists fast enough. And even if we had the money, we don't have the buildings. What's happening? We're being flooded by demand. And it turns out, it turns out, at first, you know, Greg Lukianoff and I thought, what, what are we doing on college campuses that's making students depressed? But we were wrong. It was that Gen Z began arriving with very high rates of depression and anxiety. So this graph shows uh, when the millennials, this is representative data of all teenagers, uh, when the millennials were the, uh, were the teenagers, the rates were uh, you know, five or six percent for boys and about 12 percent for girls. Um, but as Gen Z becomes the teenagers, as the Gen Z becomes the teenagers, the rates go up for boys, way, way up for girls. And that's the pattern you see over and over again. Uh, now, it's only depression and anxiety, nothing else. Only depression and anxiety. Um, now, some people have said uh, that it's not a real epidemic. Some people, like, uh, like Dr. Richard Friedman, a psychiatrist who writes beautifully in the New York Times about psychological issues, on this particular issue, I disagree with him. What he says is that it's a moral panic, don't worry. Gen Z is so comfortable talking about it. That's great. Of course the numbers are going up because there's no more stigma. So don't worry, it's not an epidemic. Gen Z is fine. And don't go blaming the phones. That's just another moral panic. Relax, he says. I believe he's wrong, and I will give you three reasons, three pieces of evidence that he is wrong, that this is real. The first is, as I said, nothing else is rising except for depression and anxiety. This is uh, data from, at Penn State, they, they uh, get data from all the other college mental health centers. Why are American college students coming in for help? And you see the, the initial presenting reason there. And over the years, over the last 10 or 15 years, um, only depression and anxiety are up. So they're not hypochondriacs. They're not saying, I've got everything. It's only depression and anxiety. Note that even stress is not up. They don't claim to be more stressed. And I've seen this in two data sets. Rather, Gen Z, we never gave them the experiences that would let them handle ordinary daily stress. So they're not more stressed, but they end up being more depressed, uh, anxious, and fragile. That's the first reason to think that this is real. The second reason, and the most powerful, is that it's not just self-report data. It shows up in any behavior related to depression and anxiety. So what you see here is the number of American teenage girls out of 100,000 in the population that are admitted to a hospital every year because they harmed themselves, so non-suicidal self-injury. And what you see is that from 2001 through 2009, there was no major, no real trend. And of course, older teen girls are the group that does this most, young teen girls the least. But what happens, look what happens to the data after 2009. The older teen girls are up 62% just in a space of about five years. This is not self-report. This is girls who cut themselves, they're bleeding, their parents are panicked, they take them to the hospital, they call 911. This is not self-report. Now the other two lines are incredibly revealing. Look what happened to the preteen girls. 10 to 14 year old girls, and here it's mostly the 13, 14 year old girls who are cutting themselves. They're up 189% the rate has nearly tripled. Another way to say this is that 10 to 14 year old girls in this, in this country did not used to cut themselves, and now they do. And they do it as much as 20 year old women. But look at the orange line. The orange line is the 20 to 24 year old women. Now these are millennials. In this data set, um, Gen Z had not yet reached 20. Note that the millennials actually are not much affected. And so this is one of the reasons that I say Gen Z is really different from the millennials. Something happened in their childhood, I believe it's in their early adolescence. Something happened that made them really different from the millennials. What is it? Um, the other piece of evidence we have uh, really solid evidence on as a behavior is suicide. So completed suicides, as you know, um, in the United States, so suicide is down globally, but in the US it's up, and it's up for almost all age groups, male and female. So we've got a lot of problems in this country. But it's up astronomically for teenage girls. It's up far more for teenage girls as a percentage than for anyone else. 
And so what you see here is the suicide rate for 10 to 14 year olds, which is quite low compared to older teens. Uh, and there was a surge for boys in the 1980s along with the surge in crime. We had a surge in crime and violence. I believe that was related to lead poisoning. We had a whole generation that was lead poisoned. Um, when we ban lead, 15 years later, crime rates plummet all over the country, violence plummets. Um, that's, I think, what, what explains the surge in the middle of the graph. But if you look where the millennials are, the millennials had very low rates, um, had relatively low rates of suicide. Orange is on the bottom is the girl, is the uh, girls. Blue is the boys. Um, girls have higher uh, rates of attempts because their attempts are, are more social and calls for help. Boys have higher rates of completed suicides because they tend to use guns and tall buildings. They use irreversible means. So um, what you see here is that um, when Gen Z becomes the 10 to 14 year olds, the rate shoots up for boys and girls, but as a percentage increase, as a percentage increase, it's by far the highest for girls. The suicide rate for 10 to 14 year old American girls is up 150% in the last 10 years or so. So, um, and a third reason, it's not just the US. So this is self-harm data in Britain, same story. Hockey stick for girls, it begins about a year later, but a hockey stick pattern for girls, the girls go shooting up all of a sudden in self-harm, boys barely anything. I should have mentioned that the boy data for self-harm in America is totally flat, um, they're not self-harming. Um, I was in Australia, New Zealand, same thing, just delayed. Um, as they told me down there, every bad idea from, Amer from America comes to us a few years late. Um, now why? Why is this happening at the same time in multiple countries with a bigger impact on girls and with the biggest impact on preteen girls? What's your hypothesis? And that brings us to point number three. Social media has transformative effects, not just on democracies, but on the lives of teenagers. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> so um, this is a graph, this is a graph of a network. This is a graph, it happens to be um, uh, telephone networks in Europe, in the, uh, cell phone networks in Europe in the 1990s. And um, <clears throat> so it's just a way to show a network where there's a lot of isolated pieces. And then this same cell phone network in Europe 10 years later um, looks like that. So imagine, imagine if this was your social network. Imagine what life would be like if this was your social network. And then suppose over the course of five or 10 years, your social network becomes like that. Would things change? Would your daily life change? Would your relationships change? Yes. Now, social media perfectly explains the timing of what happened to Gen Z. Here's the story. In 2006, Facebook opens to the world. Before then, you had to be a college student to have an account. But in 2006, anyone can have an account. But hardly any 11 and 12 year olds have an account. You have to lie and say you're 13, but there's just not a lot of 11, 12, or 13 year olds on Facebook in 2006. Um, in 2007, the iPhone comes out, and now you can have social media with you all the time, but it's expensive, and still, not a lot of preteens have it. Everything changes between 2009 and 2011. This is when Facebook introduces the like button, so now there's much more engagement, people you're liking, and I can say, especially in an audience like this, I can talk about behaviorism. You all seen, at some point in your training, the video of B.F. Skinner training a pigeon? Little tiny pellet, of, you know, of food and, and he can train the pigeon to turn in a circle in a few minutes. Well, in 2009, all teenagers became B.F. Skinner and they also became the pigeon. And they all are in a mutual reinforcement circle for whatever it is they're reinforcing. And so in 2009, Facebook and other, and then every other, other platforms copy it, Twitter copies it. Um, everyone becomes hooked up as a mutual reinforcement cycle. Um, Twitter adds the retweet button and now anything can go viral. Um, we get the news feed on Facebook being algorithmicized. And so between 2009 and 2011, the nature of social media changes. It was not toxic before. Um, and it's not just Facebook, it's all the, this, this becomes the nature of social media platforms. They're all going for engagement, which means lots of ratings. You rate each other, you comment on everything. And this is when it becomes more addictive, more fun, more enticing, uh, and this is exactly when American teenagers move their social lives wholesale onto social media. You look, see, look how steep the adoption bar is there. The graph shows the percentage of, of 12th graders and other grades um, that are using social media sites on a daily basis. I think we can say that in 2008, they were still going over to each other's homes and sometimes doing things in person. But by 2012, everything had migrated online, so they're connecting 
through their gla glass rectangles. They go home, they sit on their bed, and that's where their social life is. Now, at first, we thought, or I thought, well, maybe, maybe they're gonna be super social. Maybe they're gonna have so much social stimulation that like their brains will have this huge social module. Maybe it'll be okay. But if we superimpose that red rectangle on the graph I showed you before, you see that the timing fits perfectly. There's a two-year period where, all te where teens move online and boom, right then is when girls' depression rates go through the roof. Now, communication is great, right? Don't we wanna foster communication? Think about a conversation. You say something, your partner says something. You take turns, you respect each other, you learn about each other. What could be wrong with connecting the world? Well, what if it's not a two-way street? What if you and I are talking, but behind your back, there are two people pressing buttons and making snide comments about whatever you say? And you're much more focused on those two people than you are on me, your interlocutor. What if you're talking in front of an audience behind your, who's behind your back? Would that change the benefits of conversation? Would it change your authenticity? Of course it would. And what if it's not two people? What if it's 100 people, and they're all talking to each other? And of course, their conversation with each other about you is being rated by other people who are liking or commenting on what they say about you ad infinitum. Well, now communication doesn't necessarily look so healthy. And when you look at it this way, now you can understand why there's this huge sex difference. And the sex difference occurs in every country I've looked at. Four reasons. One, girls use social media a lot more than boys. The boys are mostly video gaming. The girls are mostly doing social media. And when the girls are on social media, they talk about emotions. The boys don't talk about emotions as much. Second reason. Girls are more affected by constant social comparison. We've known this for a long time, especially when it becomes visual. When the medium becomes photographs, girls are much more sensitive, especially teen girls. Think about how hard it was to be a 13-year-old girl, 12, 13, 14. For boys, too, but everybody hates middle school, right? That was the hardest period of life, especially for girls. Now let's make it a lot harder for girls. What do you say? So girls are much more sensitive to constant social comparison about their thinness, their beauty. Um, girls are also more affected by fear of missing out and fear of being left out. Everyone has a status hierarchy. Boys are more focused on sports, strength, toughness, um, showing that you don't care. There's a status hierarchy of boys which is more vertical. For girls, it's more about who's in, who's out. Girls are negotiating about intimacy. Who knows whose secrets? Who wasn't invited? Who was? And so social media really just connects right in to girls' worst fears and, and preys upon them. And the fourth reason is that girls and boys are equally aggressive, but their aggression is different. Boys' aggression revolves around the threat of violence. I will physically hurt you. And when it all moves online, they can't hurt each other. But girls' aggression has always been relational. I will destroy your reputation or your relationships. I will damage them in a way that you don't even know. And boy, does social media make that easy. You can do it anonymously, even on weekends. So for all these reasons, the rapid, almost instantaneous movement of social life onto social media has been devastating for teen girls, and it hasn't touched teen boys as much, at least not for depression and anxiety. For social skills, that's what I'm beginning to hear. The teen boys are they are having more trouble looking people in the eye, uh, uh, unless you give them a, a, you know, a, a game controller, maybe they can like, do that. But um, they're having more trouble socially, perhaps, but I don't have good data on that. Now, I should be clear that I'm telling you a story in which I think the data supports a causal effect of social media on mental health. There are some other uh, psychologists that disagree with me. We're in a debate right now. My summary of the debate um, and I, is that the correlational studies are amazingly consistent in showing curvilinear relationships. So if you use social media for an hour or two a day, you're not worse off than if you don't use it. But if you use it for five, six, seven hours a day, you are. You're a lot worse off. You're typically twice or three times as likely to be depressed especially for girls. Second, um, my critics, or the critics, say that yes, that's true, but the percentage of variance explained is very small. And they're right about that. That doesn't mean it's not important, it just means it's not explaining most of the story. But the experimental studies, uh, eight of the 10 that I've been able to find, eight of the 10 do show causality. When you randomly assign people to reduce or get off social media platforms, they get happier. So it's not just correlation, it's causation. 
And finally, the entire debate is on the dose response model. That is, we're all thinking of this as sugar. And you know, if kids have a little sugar, no problem. If they have a lot of sugar, bad. But social media is not like sugar. If I reduce my son's intake, which I did, he said, Dad, when he entered sixth grade, 11 years old, he said, Dad, everyone's on, so, everyone's on Instagram. Can I get Instagram? And I said, hell no. And, and he said, but, 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 and I, you know, we talked about it. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, but that meant that he was, that he felt excluded. And so I called up the one other kid who wasn't on Instagram. I called up that kid's dad and said, please, don't let your son have Instagram, as long as the, you know, our boys have each other. Um, and my son turned 13, and he's very mature, and he's very conscientious, and so my wife and I said to him, okay, now that you're 13, we, let's talk about it again. You know, we, we're, we're willing to reconsider. And he said, actually, you know, I don't want that. It's stupid. So, um, um, so anyway, the, <laughs> yeah. so the point is there are network effects. And while my son is better off in the long run being off it, um, when you look at the data, often the people who are off it are not doing any better than those who are on because it, it completely changes the network effects, especially for girls. So um, um, we have to look at emergent effects, and that's where I think you'll have special insight because it's not just like sugar. There are network effects, emergent effects, and group interaction. And so how many of you know the work of Nicholas Christakis or you read this book, Connected? Raise your hand. Nicholas Christakis. He wrote a book called Connected. He's like the major researcher of networks. So I, I urge you to look into his work. You can buy, this book is from like 2009, uh, but it still is very good. I would urge you to think about it because there's a lot of great research on how people affect each other by very indirect means. And he became famous for um, analyzing the Framingham heart data and they found that if one person becomes obese, that actually makes other people in the network become more likely to become obese. Okay, not a surprise. Here's the surprise. We also affect our friends friends whom we've never met. And they even find that we affect our friends, friends, friends. Now I find that hard to believe and the effect is small, but, but I am convinced that we do affect our friends, friends whom we've never met. Social actions are contagious. And that was before social media linked us all together. So uh, that's, here he shows that happiness runs in, in streams and clusters. People affect each other. Um, he did a follow-up study uh, using smiling on Facebook networks and found that people who smile a lot in their profiles are connected to people who smile a lot in their profiles. And we're influencing our friends and our friends' friends. But it's not just happiness. Um, they also did a study, a separate study, of depression. And what they found is this. Depression scores are strongly correlated with, uh, with such scores in one's, uh, in one's friends and neighbors. The association extended up to three degrees of separation to one's friends, 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 especially for girls. Female friends appear to be especially influential in the spread of depression from one person to another because girls and women talk about their depression. And as a 16-year-old in Australia told me, I'm not even depressed, but I have to act like I am. Okay, so social media, I think, is, is one of the biggest causes, and it perfectly explains the gender difference. But there's another huge factor, which should be of interest to all psychologists, especially those who work with teens or, or kids. Um, and so raise your hand if you know the word anti-fragile or anti-fragility. Raise your hand if you know what that means. You've heard that word. Okay, I'm going to do you a huge favor. I'm going to give you the most important word of 2020. This is going to be the most important psychological word for this year, anti-fragile. Once you have it, you'll see it, you'll see it operating everywhere, it's amazing. Um, so this is the point of that first great untruth. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Now, most of you have heard the phrase, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. That was from Friedrich Nietzsche. <clears throat> now Nietzsche was, was right. I have a whole chapter in the happiness hypothesis on this. Um, and so <clears throat> the reason Nietzsche is right is that human beings, and especially children, are anti-fragile. And it's a word that was invented by Nassim Taleb, who wrote the book The Black Swan. Taleb um, is one of the few people who predicted the financial meltdown, because he said the banking system has never been tested. It's so fragile. If anything goes wrong, it's all going down. And he was right. And after that happens, he's reflecting on complex systems that have not been tested. And he says, what's the word for systems that get stronger when you shock them, when you drop them, when you stress them? What's the word for that? 
And people would say, oh, resilience. We want things to be resilient. And he'd say, no, no, no. Resilience just means that you don't break. So think about it this way. A wine glass is fragile, and so we would never give a wine glass to a toddler because they'll play with it and they'll break it. What do we give them? Sippy cups, we give them plastic, because plastic doesn't break. But when a kid throws down a plastic cup, does it get better? Of course not, it's resilient. What's the word for things that get better when you throw them down? There isn't one. Anti-fragile, that's right. So Taleb had to invent a word, the opposite of fragile. It gets stronger when you drop it. And here are some examples. Bones are anti-fragile. If you take it easy on your bones, they get weak. If you stress them, they get strong. Muscles are the same way. There are a lot of biological systems that respond to the stressors by getting as strong as they need to get to deal with the stressors. The immune system is the best example. Why have peanut allergies been going up? The older people in this room all remember taking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to school. But now it's like taking plutonium. Sensors go off, you know, your kid will be expelled. Why are American kids so, why do they have such high rates of peanut allergy? Well, some epidemiologists noticed that this is only happening in countries that tell pregnant women to avoid peanuts. And so they did a very simple experiment. They recruited, uh, they recruited, so there's a, an Israeli snack food called bamba, which is like a puffed corn, like a Cheeto type thing with a dusting of peanut dust, so a bit of a peanut butter flavor, and you know, it dissolves in your mouth, a three month old can eat it. So what they did uh, was they recruited 640 women who had recently given birth, and their babies had, were at higher risk of peanut allergy because they had another immune issue, eczema or egg allergy. Recruited these women, randomly assigned either to get, um, to get bags of bamba and say, go home, feed your kid. If he's still alive in five years, let us know. No, it's, I mean, obviously, you know, they, they were careful, they monitored. Um, but half of them were told, give your kid bamba three times a week. The other half were told, standard advice, no peanuts, and you know what? Because peanut proteins will come through your milk, you, mother, avoid peanuts and peanut products. Okay, so standard advice. What happens when they test them thoroughly at the age of five? They test the baby, they test the kids. Standard condition, 17% have developed a peanut allergy. For the rest of their lives, these kids will be anxious in restaurants, anxious everywhere about food. The rest of their lives, they have this burden. What happened when they were given Bamba? 3%, only 3% had a peanut allergy. We could nearly wipe out peanut allergies by doing the exact opposite of what we've been doing to protect kids. And that's why our subtitle of, of, of the book is how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. We've been doing this to Gen Z over and over again with the best of intentions. We're protecting anti-fragile kids and that weakens them. So let's try the experiment again with the whole child. It worked well with peanuts. Let's wrap the whole kid in bubble wrap so that they won't get hurt. We don't want our kids to get hurt, but if you do that, you have to always be there to protect them from getting hurt because they don't learn how to protect themselves. And if your kid uh, forgets his, his lunchbox, you think, oh my God, she's not, gonna, you know, she's not gonna have food. I'd better drive to school and deliver the lunchbox because I would hate it if my child learned the lesson to remember her lunchbox tomorrow. <laughs> So we're always there for them, and they don't have to learn to fend for themselves. And if you're always there for them, then you have to keep being there even when they graduate from college. And parents are now helping their kids find a job. Okay, that's not bad necessarily. Uh, but I teach in a business school, and I talk with a lot of business people, and they tell me, beginning with the late millennials, and especially now with that's Gen Z's entering, they say, I gave an employee a, a bad performance review, and I heard from his mother because helicopter parents never give up. They're always there. And I can show you how radically things changed with a very simple demonstration. What I want you to all do, everyone in this audience, um, think about at the age at which you were let out. What age could you go outside, go over to a friend's house, you and your friend could go to a park, go get ice cream, whatever it was, you're independent. So if it was first grade that that happened, you should say six. I'll ask you all in a moment, you should say six. If it wasn't until seventh grade, you should say 12. So look at that list or just remember the age at which you were let out. And I want you to answer by generation. So first we're gonna start with just Gen X and older. So if you were born in 1982 or earlier, raise your hand high right now. Okay, so all of you are Gen X 
and older. All right, so think of your number. I'm gonna just point around the room. When my finger points to your section, just yell out, you know, nine or five, whatever it is, you yell it out. Okay, ready, go. Okay, so you hear that? I heard one 12 and a sea of sixes and a bunch of eights. And this is what I found all over the country because this used to be the norm. Until, uh, until the 80s or 90s, the norm was you go out between six and eight, certainly by third grade. Because if there was a kid in your house, if you suppose you're in fourth grade, and there's one kid in your town, and that kid is not allowed out to play, you'd be like, oh my God, what is wrong with those parents? Okay? But nowadays, if you see a fourth grader outside in a park, everyone's like, oh my God, what is wrong with those parents? Okay, so now we're gonna answer. Now we probably don't have, uh, I don't know if we have any Gen Z. Raise your hand, we'll go with late millennials too. Raise your hand if you were born in 1993 or later. Do we have anyone? Okay, we have one, two, three, four. Okay, we only have a few. You know what? How many of you have kids who were born between 1995 uh, and uh, 2002? Raise your hand if you have so. Okay, all of you answer as your child. At what age did you let your kid out? Think about what age your kid could go out you know, on, totally on her own, okay? So, if you're either Gen Z or you have uh, older Gen Z kids, think about your number. Let's try this again. Yell it out nice and loud. Okay? So, you, yeah, so you hear the difference, okay? So we had a sea change. We've had a sea change in childhood. Why? Why? Because, the, because of dangers, that's right. But, but which way did the dangers go? Is it more dangerous or less dangerous? The crime rate, the crime, we had a giant crime wave in this country. It ended in the early 1990s, okay? Kids, you know, kids in New York City got mugged, but nobody would think, that, oh, you can't go outside. So w during the crime wave, we all played outside. And as soon as the crime wave ended, parents said, you, no way you're going outside, you'll be abducted. Okay, so we really did a number on Gen Z. Just as we made the world physically safe for them, we said it's too dangerous to go outside, stay inside, stay where I can supervise and overprotect you. And then that same generation, we cracked down, they didn't get independence, they're the first ones who got social media in middle school. So we said the world out, the physical world is too dangerous and we were wrong, whereas the online world is safe and we were wrong. Um, my friend Lenore Skenazy, who wrote the book Free Range Kids, uh, she's known as America's worst mom because she let her nine-year-old ride this New York City subways in 2009, and there was outrage, how can you do this? Uh, so she's really funny, and um, she has a site I, uh, and, and uh, 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 a wonderful project at letgrow.org. I urge you to go there if you have kids or work with kids, letgrow.org. Anyway, Lenore um, has rewritten the titles of childhood classics for Gen Z, for today's overprotected generation, like, oh, the places you won't go. <laughs> The Playdates of Huckleberry Finn, <laughs> Harold and the Purple Sofa, Encyclopedia Brown Solves the Worksheet, and my favorite, Dora in the Ford Explorer. <laughs> so. But what happens when we don't let kids play unsupervised? Unsupervised play is the most nutritious thing you can give to a child. That's what mammals need. All mammals play because our brains need to wire up. It's part of the mammal program. And when we deprive kids of free play, unsupervised play, what happens? A rise in depression and anxiety. Peter Gray predicted this in 2011, just before the rise began. He said, if we don't let kids play, we're gonna have depression and anxiety, and he was right. He writes, play functions as the major means by which children develop intrinsic interests, learn how to make decisions, solve problems, self-control, regulate emotions, make friends, and experience joy. Play is the most nutritious thing. Free play, unsupervised play. No, you don't make the rules. You don't go out and buy the, you just let them decide what to do and they will find something to do. That's the way kids used to develop. Um, and in all these ways, play promotes mental health. Now, there's another thing that wasn't on Gray's list, but he, um, and that is risk. It's incredibly important to let kids take risks because they're gonna have to judge risk for themselves when they leave. And you're not gonna suddenly say, okay, now you're 18, you've never made a decision yourself, go out and judge risk. You can't do that. 
And so um, Alison Gopnik wrote this wonderful essay in the Wall Street Journal, should we let our toddlers play with saws and knives, as they do in Germany and Switzerland and Germanic countries, they do let them, they have forest schools. The kids learn to take risks, they do burn their fingers on the fire once. Um, and so she says the answer is probably yes, and she writes, Trying to eliminate all such risks from children's lives might actually be dangerous. There may be a psychological analog to the hygiene hypothesis, which is what I told you about peanuts. If you, if you don't let the immune system develop a response, then the kid's actually weaker. And so she says, in the same way, by shielding children from every possible risk, we may lead them to react with exaggerated fear to situations that aren't risky at all and isolate them from the adult skills that they will one day have to master. Once again, we're protecting our kids with good intentions, but because they're anti-fragile, we're harming them. And now, just in the last few years, we're beginning to see kids talking about emotional safety, which is, I think, a terrible concept. Look at this quote. We are all balloons filled with feelings in a world full of pins. Okay, we all understand that. Sometimes it feels that way. But do you want to encourage kids to think of themselves as a balloon full of feelings? How will they live their lives? Will they move to the edge of their abilities? Will they challenge themselves? Will they take risks? No. Um, and I'm not saying we need to go back to this, OK? Playgrounds, I mean, kids used to die with, on dangerous playgrounds. And you know what kills you does not make you stronger. So, so, uh, you know, I'm thrilled that my kids live in a physically safe world. But I think that this is actually optimal because the kinds of playgrounds that the older folks here and I grew up on, you could actually get hurt. So think about the seesaw, okay? What part of your body is acting up? I say seesaw, where do you feel it? In your butt. Because at some point you were doing seesaw and somebody did that joke where they get off and you go crashing down, right? So I don't think anyone's ever been killed by that, but you can get hurt. And that's really important because every day kids were getting practice in judging. Is she gonna do it? Should I do it first? Well, you know, they're working it out. And yes, there's risk, but we have to give kids that kind of risk because in a playground like this, you can get hurt, which means every day you are learning how to not get hurt. Whereas my kids and your kids were raised on this. They were engineered so that kids couldn't get hurt, which means they have no opportunity to learn how to not get hurt. Now, um, a motto of our book and a basic motto for child rearing should be this. Prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. Um, successful people have known this for thousands of years. It's a basic principle of training. So take the famous case of Demosthenes. He was a great orator in ancient Greece, and he had a speech impediment. And he needed to argue his family's case. His family had a legal case. Uh, and he had to argue it in the court at Athens. And the court was the people. You go to the public square. Your, your adversary is there. You make your case. He makes his case. The people decide. That was direct democracy. But if you have a speech impediment, you're going to be an embarrassment. So what does he do? Um, he practices his oration by putting pebbles in his mouth. And then he gives. He, by, the, right, he, by the sea, he puts pebbles in his mouth by the seashore and he shouts his oration out so that when he takes the pebbles out, it's easier. And he would do sprints to get out of breath and then he'd give his oration so that when he was at the court and not out of breath, it would be easier. And this is the principle that Olympic athletes use. They train at high altitudes where there's less oxygen. So their body adapts, their blood literally adapts and makes more hemoglobin. They adapt to the tougher condition so that when they compete at sea level, they're supercharged. That's the right way to prepare. What do we do on college campuses? The exact opposite. We say, come, we'll give you four years in which there'll be no, nothing to offend you. We will ban microaggressions. We will punish people who say things that someone else thinks are offense. We'll ban it. We'll punish it. We'll have deans to do it. We have an uh, anonymous reporting system to do it. We will wipe clean anything that could damage you or harm you emotionally for four years so that when you go into a regular American office, you will find it completely intolerable. <laughs> Taleb has this wonderful piece of advice in the book. He points out that a candle is fragile if one puff of wind and it blows out. So you have to put a hurricane, you have to put a glass thing around it. You have to protect a candle flame. But when a fire gets big enough, the more you blow on it, the brighter it gets. 
And so Taleb says, you want to be the fire and wish for the wind. And this is something I think we all should wish for, for our kids, for our students, for young people in therapy. So uh, to close up here, I'll just close with a few thoughts about um, how we desperately need better groups. Uh, and just a few thoughts on how, but really it's, it's up to you to figure out how. So my few thoughts are, we are in an age that is transforming faster than any previous time in history. I mean, the 1890s were pretty intense. There have been previous times when electricity came in, when everything changed quickly. But boy, are we in, in one of those now. Just in a few years, everything has changed. Um, and it has really changed Gen Z, and Gen Z has just begun entering the corporate world uh, in the last two years. They began graduating only in 2018. So they're coming into the corporate world, and I'm hearing all these stories now. People say, you know, uh, if, uh, if a light bulb burns out, my young employees won't change it. They want to go get permission. They say, what should I do, boss? I say, uh, change the light bulb. Um, so we're, we've created a generation that is not as robust, not as, as, as good at taking initiative. It's going to be very hard to integrate Gen Z into the workplace. Um, and um, everybody in the psychological community has to realize that if you're dealing with uh, companies or organizations, as they bring Gen Z in, rates of depression and anxiety are going to be skyrocketing. And at an even bigger level, our democracy is transforming. And again, I'm suggesting to you that we are, in fact, unsuited for life in large, diverse, secular societies. What we're trying to do is really, really hard. It is not impossible because we've done it, but it's really, really hard. And we have to pay enormous attention to getting the parameters right. What do we do to make groups and networks work well? Um, I've created a program with, with some colleagues called Open Mind. It applies the principles of moral psychology to give people the skills to have conversations. If you go to openmindplatform.org, um, it's free for small groups. Eventually we'll charge, but for now it's, it's free. Um, and it walks people through, it's an, it's an education technology platform. It walks you through why should you want to be exposed to people who are different from you, who think differently, who vote differently. Why would you want that? Um, it gives you some basic principles of social and moral psychology, and it teaches you how to start a conversation. Acknowledge something first before you critique. Um, it, it tries to trigger feelings of moral humility and, and, and intellectual humility. So we're working on that, but it's available for use. We, it's a pretty good edition up there right now. Um, and I want to end with one of the best psychological ideas of all for helping groups to work better. So this is Pauli Murray, who was an early civil rights activist. Um, she is uh, we, we, would, we would either gay or we would now actually say trans, perhaps. Um, uh, African-American, uh, trained as a, a, a minister and also got a law degree. There's a new residential college at Yale named for her. And here she is writing before Martin Luther King um, was active. She writes in the, 1946, I intend to destroy segregation by positive and embracing methods. When my brothers try to draw a circle to exclude me, I shall draw a larger circle to include them. Where they speak out for the privileges of a puny group, I shall shout for the rights of all mankind. So we have a lot of psychological tools in our toolbox for how to make groups work better, especially as they're more divided by politics, by identity groups, uh, by all sorts of things that are amplified by social media and tearing groups apart and increasing conflict. But we have the tools to do it, and we have the knowledge to do it. Um, and that's why I'm, again, so excited to come here to a group that thinks about groups. Uh, and I wish you uh, all, all success in your meetings today and in your careers. Um, I hope that it's been helpful to think about some of these issues that are, that are coming along. And in conclusion, let's all just zoom out and say how lucky we all are simply to be alive at this time sharing this universe with each other. Thank you. Thank you.